onto magic threads. Examining the title of this conference, Clash and Convergence, Explorations of Culture in an Age of Uncertainty, my mind leaps to ways one might bridge these competing influences, clash and convergence. Immediately I leap to the notion of storytelling. As a matter of fact, I think storytelling and narrative serve as the magic thread that holds popular culture together. Across mass media, politics, sports, consumer culture, and the capitalist system, storytelling and narrative are the foundational tools employed to achieve some end. Whether it's Coca-Cola employing a post-colonial commercial to sell more fizzy brown water, or politicians selling the idea that higher education is only beneficial if it leads directly to jobs, or at least job skills. As in so many areas, Facebook's an interesting case study in storytelling. On one hand, the site provides each of us with more or less our own entertainment network. While at the same time, corporations and other organizations are increasingly employing the site to market to consumers who have haplessly signed over the rights to their personal information in return. Technology is enabling organizations to create a closer bond to consumers via storytelling. As if each product or service has some intimate tie to one's life that is just longing to be told. As always, in attempting to figure out the broader meaning, I turn to my defining question, WWRBD, what would Ray Brown do? <laughs> For Ray, the story that he told was simple, yet given the times, fraught with personal and professional challenges, why popular culture matters. I think I may have uncovered Ray's most direct definition of popular culture in Symbiosis, Popular Culture and Other Fields, which was published in 1988 which he co-edited with his uh, oft co-editor, Marshall Fishwick. Quote, people equal cultures, end quote. Given Ray's work establishing popular culture in academe, I think we now need to turn to him again for a different reason. In addition to defining popular culture, Brown also provided scholars with a method of inquiry. In my mind, this is the way we should employ Ray's thinking today. He showed us the magic in the magic thread. While other scholarly disciplines return again and again to their intellectual leaders, for example, literacy scholars and Maxine Green, or curriculum theorists to John Dewey, popular culture scholars have not kept Brown in the forefront, even though his thinking tells us not just what popular culture is, arguably less important today, but how we examine the field theoretically. Brown, for his part, is clear that popular culture scholars should be open to a myriad of theories and methodologies. In his famous essay, The Theory Methodological Complex, he explains, quote, not basing our whole point of view and theory and methodology on one approach, we can more easily shift gears and see other points of approach and view, end quote. Clearly, this is not anti-theory, but all-inclusive and reliant and not reliant on the latest fads. Instead, the researcher should employ the tools needed to complete a job, pulling from disciplines that make sense to the project. Brown's even more clear, even more direct in clearing the path in symbiosis. Quote, the popular culture approach is the omni and humanistic approach. The popular culture scholar and critic realizes that the most valid results of his or her investigation can be achieved if the critic mixes all the theories and methodologies of other disciplines using as much or little as needed to see the phenomena from all sides and through all dimensions. The most nearly comprehensive analysis then is that omni-humanistic investigation that is as broad as possible. Despite Brown's influence on popular culture studies, for those of us here and around the globe who recognize his importance, my concern is that Brown's work is not properly acknowledged or cited in most popular culture readers currently on the market. He's viewed as a popularizer of pop popular culture rather than one of its intellectual guides. For example, neither the second volume, second edition of Marcel Denise's Popular Culture Inter Introductory Perspectives, 
published by Roman and Littlefield in 2012, nor Leroy Ashby's mammoth 712 page, With Amusement for All, A History of American Popular Culture Since 1830, University of Kentucky 2006, reference Brown et al. Certainly individuals who knew Brown and the many academics that studied him have kept his memory alive. Here at Bowling Green, at this conference, via the Pop Culture Association, the regional meetings, in my own case, I think Gary Hoppenstand and Kathy Murlock Jackson are sick of me asking questions about what it was like to study with Ray Brown <laughs> and what it was like to work with him. In fact, when they see me coming, they hit, hit, the, hit the bricks and run the other way. <laughs> The sad fact, however, is that many popular culture study scholars, and particularly young scholars, are not engaging with him intellectually. Ray gave popular culture scholars the keys to the kingdom, but we have essentially turned our backs on him as our intellectual guide. 